Hey everyone, I'm Andy Raphael from eTechnics.com and welcome to the wall of motherboards. <laughs> Let's do this. So hopefully you can see X570 is now upon us and essentially what I have here is a lot of boards from a lot of different brands. I'm actually missing one but we have got the results for it and that's the MSI Meg Ace motherboard. We had to rotate it and so it got taken away but we will have results of that as well as all of these boards. But what I want to go through is the aesthetics, some of the kind of the main features and what differentiates each of these boards from each other. So I'm going to move these out of the way, go through each one and hopefully we can see which X570 motherboard is right for you. So as I mentioned, I wanna go through this great big stack of motherboards, but there is actually one that was taken away from us prematurely, the MSI Meg X570 Ace motherboard. Now, I just really wanna go through all of these from an aesthetic standpoint, kind of briefly touch on the features and then get straight into the benchmarks because as you can appreciate, most of these X570 motherboards when it comes to performance are pretty similar. So I think for the most part, this video is gonna be kind of a guide for you guys to sort of see which one is right for you based on maybe the looks, the design, the features, and then of course, ultimately price. Now, when it comes to price, I have price on a few of these boards, but not all of them. So instead, I'll probably end up linking to them uh, in the description below. And you can kind of, you know, see what the prices are depending on your region, because otherwise we will be here all day and we do want to obviously get through this as quickly as possible. So the Meg X570 Ace from MSI, kind of, I guess, your mid to high, high end sort of range motherboard. It's not in the creation series. It's not quite a godlike, but it is, I guess, somewhere in between. It has a really, really nice, unique kind of style and design to it. Very reminiscent of the godlike motherboard, which we do actually have here. So you will sort of see that as well. Uh, we're going to overlay lots of B-roll as well, so hopefully you know you can get a good idea as to how the board looks. Lots of uh, space for NVMe, a nice amount of phases, and it should sort of you know suit anyone down to the ground, especially when you look at the amount of RGB on there and that zero frozer fan design, uh, coupled with some of the new technologies that MSI have actually invested into the board. So the next one that we're looking at is the ASUS Prime X570 Pro. I've always been a fan of the Prime boards purely because they add kind of a little bit of white styling, which we don't generally see on motherboards. Yes, it is a bit plasticky here and there, but still a really nice board. And one of them boards that kind of generally offers good value for money when you look at the features. So for DIMM slots, we have plenty of PCI Express slots for you know uh, multiple expansion cards. We've got two M.2 PCI Express 4.0 slots, of course. One of them being covered by this heatsink and one of them kind of a bit bare, which I'm a little bit disappointed about, but generally when it comes to the Prime boards, they are very reasonable uh, when it comes to the price of them. On the rear I.O. Rear we have plenty of USB for connectivity options, and I'm probably going to say this is gonna be aimed more at content creators, workstation kind of users, not your hardcore gamers. We definitely have some different boards for those people. Now, a lot of people may not necessarily need a full-size ATX or E-ATX motherboard. Sadly, there's not really any micro ATX motherboards out there on the X570 platform, but when it comes to mini ITX, we have this little beast. This is the Gigabyte X570i Aorus Pro Wi-Fi. So as the name suggests, yes, it does come included with Wi-Fi. It's a, I guess, and I love this kind of phrase, a pint-sized powerhouse. We have a PCI Express NVMe drive slot on the back. We also have one situated just underneath this fan, which helps keep the M.2 drive nice and cool, as well as obviously the PCH chipset. Being mini ITX, we do have a single PCI Express slot on here. And something that's really sort of unique about this board is it has an eight layer PCB, which is pretty astounding for a board of this size. Lots of phases, so when it comes to providing kind of clean, stable power to the board, it should be doing a very, very good job and should give you some extra room, uh, headroom when it comes to overclocking. Out of sort of all the mini ITX boards out there, I mean, there are only, I think, three from various different brands, but this is probably my favorite one. I mean, it even has a heatsink on the back of it. Pretty cool, right? Next up is the ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix X570 E Gaming. Now, anyone who knows kind of me and has watched kind of, you know, any of our videos in the past, you'll know I'm a big advocate of the E Gaming series. They seem to offer pretty much the best balance when it comes to features, specification, and obviously that more important price point. Now with this, when I say specifications, you're talking two M.2 PCI Express slots, uh, a nice kind of design. This is probably what I like about the e-gaming the most, the general design of it. Looks very premium without that premium price tag that you'd get maybe with the Crosshair 8 Hero that we're gonna look at in a little bit. You can see that it has 
lots of room, I guess, for RGB sort of on the rear I.O. Uh, it does have this weird little tab on there, which I'm still not a, a big fan of, but just a generally nice looking board. Three X16 slots and uh, being an e-gaming, of course, it does have Wi-Fi. So everything you expect from the X570 chipset and maybe that little bit more. We do have eight SATA ports on here as well. So when you look at I guess these being, you know, that mid-range, good price point, aggressively priced board. I mean, there's nothing that's really missing. Maybe another M.2 slot, but two's enough, right? So as I say, if you want to go that little bit higher in the Asus ROG range, then that's where this bad boy comes in. The Crosshair 8 Hero. The Hero, again, has been one of them boards that's kind of always aggressively priced, considering the features that you get. So again, we have two M.2 uh, NVMe PCI Express 4.0 drive slots, both covered under this large heatsink area, which also covers up the PCH uh, chipset fan. Lots of cooling around the, uh, around the VRMs and the CPU socket itself, and a large chunky IO shield, which does have plenty of connectivity options, including lots of USB, 2.5G ethernet, as well as a normal gigabit ethernet. Wi-Fi as well included, eight pin, four pin, plenty of power going to the board, eight SATA ports, what else do you need? The Hero board has always been, again, one of my favorite boards. It just offers, I guess, something a little bit more than what the eGaming does in terms of the extreme performance. Generally, you can overclock a little bit higher on these. It does have the Supreme FX audio as well and plenty of connectivity options around the board. Lots of fan headers. It just kind of, I guess, ticks all of the right boxes. Another board that offers great value for money is from Gigabyte with their Aorus uh, X570 Aorus Pro. They do actually do a Pro Wi-Fi version as well, which is gonna cost you a little bit more. Sadly, this one doesn't have Wi-Fi, but will be a lot, lot cheaper. The Pro always, again, a bit like with, I guess, uh, Zeus and the Strix eGaming, offers you great value for money based on the features that you get. So with all X570 boards, apart from one, which I will show in a bit, does have an active fan uh, cooling solution, two M.2 PCI Express uh, 4.0 um, slots on there we have three x16 slots with the shielded armor the memory has shielded armor as well and a large heatsink area around the cpu socket in terms of connectivity options plenty of usb and we also get a hdmi port on there as well if you decided to use this maybe with an apu product as we know the 3400g and the 3200g are going to be coming out in the near future but we also have apus on the second gen ryzen which this board will support due to am4 and the backwards uh, compatibility that AMD have put into it. So yeah, a pretty good board considering what the price is hopefully going to be. As we know, X570 is going to be a little bit more expensive than say Z390, but look at the extra features you're getting in terms of PCIe Gen 4 and those extra super speed USBs. Now with Gigabyte and their Aorus Ranger motherboards, when you start moving up the stack, you start noticing quite a few extra features. Yes, we have lost a few SATA ports. We only have six on here, but for the most part, six is gonna be more than enough because they've added another PCI Express 4.0 M.2 slot. So now we have one, two and three. There's three X16 slots, all of them included uh, with the armor on there to help you with EFI protection, as well as to look pretty cool. Around the CPU socket, we have a 14 phase design. So for overclocking and providing clean, stable power, it should be more than enough, as well as the two eight pin power connectors at the top. To keep things nice and cool, we have a large heatsink area around the top, as well as over the PCH chipset fan and obviously over the M.2. But as we turn the board over, you'll see that it has this kind of heatsink jacket, shall we say, on the rear of it with some subtle Aorus branding. Because it is kind of high up in the stack with the master, we do get Wi-Fi as well as more USBs than you'd even know what to do with. Gold-plated connectors for the audio, SP diff. We've got the 2.5G uh, gigabit ethernet and some handy little buttons, including the clear CMOS and Q flash BIOS buttons. And then up here with your debug switching uh, of your BIOS power and reset buttons. So I guess for anyone who is an enthusiast and even moving into the hardcore overclocker, maybe this is gonna be the board for you. I know for a fact that Pete, who does all of our written motherboard reviews, is a big advocate of the master series motherboards. On Z390, he uses it in kind of his main test bench. So I'm guessing this is gonna be the board for him. What about you? Now, moving back to Asus, we know that they have their tough gaming series. And obviously along with that comes a very unique style and design. So you kind of see, I guess the black and white gray, uh, black and sort of gray color scheme, as well as, you know, these accents of yellow on there. So if you are kind of looking at a system that's gonna be based on that theme, you do have obviously memory out there, graphics cards out there, SSDs, that all kind of follow the same tough gaming alliance color scheme. 
Now, I guess it's classed as kind of one of your, your no frills options when you look at the X570 Plus, but this is the Wi-Fi model, so of course we do get Wi-Fi on there. You don't get the built-in backplate, but obviously this is aimed at a more aggressive price point. Plenty of USBs, DisplayPort and HDMI, USB Type-C, and much, much more. When it comes to storage, this is something that actually really surprised me with this board. It is aimed at being kind of your budget to mid-end board, but it has got four SATA ports here, as well as four here, so eight SATA ports. This is gonna be perfect for sort of maybe a HTPC if you don't mind going with the ATX form factor. It has got improved audio over kind of your generic boards and it has got two X16 slots and two NVMe PCI Express 4.0 slots with thanks to the X570 chipset and use of a Ryzen third generation processor. Other than that, there's not really too much to say about this board. It's one of the ones that just kind of does everything that it says it's going to do on the tin. Obviously you are restricted by kind of the color scheme, but if you want to go with this color scheme, then I'd say this is going to be the board for you. So now moving on, I guess, to the more extreme side of things. That's where the MSI Meg X570 Godlike comes in. This was one of the boards that actually came in our AMD kit with our two processors, the 3700X and the 3900X. So to start with, I want to talk about the CPU socket. It has a 14 plus four plus one phase design. That means it's going to be absolutely amazing at overclocking, at least on paper. To provide that power, we have two 8-pin power connectors up the top. You have your typical 24-pin over here with a USB Type-C, plenty of other USB connectors, and also six SATA ports. For other kind of connectivity options, we've got four PCI Express X16 slots. We have three NVMe PCI Express 4.0 M.2 slots. The top one being catered for by a third generation Ryzen processor, if you're using it with this board, and the bottom two coming from the X570 chipset. Now, in terms of cooling around the board, you can see that we have a large heatsink cooler over by the rear IO, one at the top, and then down the bottom with the fan. Now, connecting all of the cooling solutions, you can see that we have a single heat pipe, which actually runs around the CPU socket through the VRMs to dissipate that heat and down into the PCH chipset cooler, which does have the zero frozen design. So when it's not in use, the fan will actually go into a zero decibel state. Other than that, we have lots of areas for RGB, including this little area for animated graphics as well, where you can upload your own uh, stuff. Plenty of room for RGB connectivity as well, including um, three pin and four pin um, RGB headers. And there's plenty of fan headers scattered around the board as well. Down the bottom for the overclockers out there, we have power and reset, as well as the all important game boost. For anyone who's never overclocked, you simply turn this round to the specified preset, and guess what? You're now overclocked. Yes, this is expensive. Um, yes, it is extreme. That's kind of what you expect, right? And it does come with plenty of connectivity options. So we do have Wi-Fi, plenty of USB, 2.5 G Ethernet, as well as um, the larger headphone um, port as well, which connects into the Extreme Audio DAC, which is situated down here. There are a few little adding cards and bits and bobs for this as well. And uh, if you want to find out more about this board or any of the boards we've been looking at, we will have full uh, written reviews linked below, as well as uh, video reviews in the coming days. Moving on to the next one. Now looking at the high end from ASRock, I'm going to be honest with you, this board only actually came in, well, yesterday. So I haven't exactly had a lot of time with it, but you will notice that ASRock, I mean, they've been up in their game a lot when it comes to the design and style. ATX form factor, everything is kind of black and silver, but everything looks very, very premium. And I love the little kind of cog that's on here that we have seen. I mean, even on the box and it has kind of the cogs in that, but they've just kind of taken it one step further in terms of that premium style. This whole area here actually comes off and does give you access to your M.2 slots, which situated just up here and just down here. There's three X16 slots for graphics cards and they are all featuring the armor. It's a bit weird that the memory doesn't actually have any EFI protection on there, but you know, I'm not one to judge. A large heatsink area up here, as well as around the CPU socket and plenty of connectivity options, including eight SATA ports. When it comes to sort of overclockers, we have a power and reset button down here and a debug LED and plenty of connectivity options scattered around the board. On the rear of the board, you will also notice that it does have some kind of heatsink armor on there as well to provide you a stable platform to build with, as well as to uh, obviously help dissipate heat because I'm gonna be honest, X570 is a little bit hotter than most chipsets out there. Now, the main thing you will notice is down the side of the board, there is these two light bars to provide extra RGB. So you've got RGB connectivity options there as well as sort of just around the uh, PCH chipset and this area over here as well. When this is lit up, it looks absolutely amazing. It does incorporate purity sound as well, and on the rear IO, plenty of connectivity options, including Wi-Fi, USB, but only a single uh, ethernet port. 
And it's really weird. I went on ASRock's website and I was kind of hoping that a Tai Chi Ultimate was going to hit, maybe with 10 GBE uh, capabilities, which is normally from the Aquantia chipset, but no mention of it on the X570 chipset. Come on, ASRock, make it happen. Now, I don't want to say that I'm leaving the best till last, but in my personal opinion, I'm leaving the best till last. Obviously, I have to remain unbiased, but this board, it just does something that all of the other boards that we've looked at today simply doesn't. It kind of breaks the mold a little bit. And the first thing you're going to notice is that it doesn't have any fan on there. Every other X570 board out there, whether it be Mini ITX, Micro ATX, ATX or EATX, has a fan. This is the only one that doesn't. And it's because it has this large kind of armored plate that covers over pretty much the majority of the board. So it kind of acts a bit like a heatsink, and that travels actually around the back of the board as well. So yes, we have an EATX form factor, but they've done a few other things with it as well. So while they do have this cooling solution, which covers over the one, two, three M.2 slots, which are all PCI Express 4.0 NVMe capable, we do find that we have a few other unique features. So as we look down this side, you can see that all of our connectivity options are actually sort of coming out the board this way as opposed to vertically. So if you do have a chassis that has EATX capabilities, it's gonna be a lot easier to plug everything into here. The only thing I would have liked to have seen is maybe what EVGA did and put the eight pin power connectors down here instead. Um, but yeah, they've kept it up here, but it does have shielding armor on there as well. It does the same on the memory and the PCI Express slots. Lots of phases up here for providing clean, stable power to the processor and hopefully giving you that headroom as well. Power and reset for the hardcore overclockers. You have BIOS switches down here as well, six SATA ports and plenty of other connectivity options scattered either down here or at the top or this handy little panel, which you can remove, which gives you another six pin power connector to provide extra power to the board and a few other connectivity uh, options. If you don't require it and you think it looks a bit ugly, you can simply put this uh, panel back on and it's all hidden, kind of like a bit, I don't know, like an, a piece of armor. Yeah, this is definitely my favorite. On the rear IO, you can see that we have USB in abundance. We have Wi-Fi, clear CMOS and Q-Flash BIOS, as well as our optical SP diff and gold-plated optical connectors. We do have a 10 GBE as well, Ethernet, as well as a standard gigabit Ethernet. So there's nothing really that this board doesn't sort of provide you with. Problem is, it's very expensive, but in the grand scheme of things compared to the godlike, it's about the same price. Compared to, I'm, I'm sure, Azus's offerings, it's about the same price. So yeah, let's get this board out of the way and talk about performance. So now that we got the performance out of the way, you've probably seen that we didn't do any overclocks and there's a very good reason why. When we started overclocking on these boards, we got to about sort of number four, maybe even number five, and we noticed that res the results we were getting were pretty much the same, which I think we were restricted by the heat, the voltage, and the processors in general, the 3700X and the 3900X. So what does that mean for, I guess these motherboard manufacturers touting that they have 16 phase VRMs or 14 plus four plus one or 12 or, an eight layer PCB. Well, I guess for the hardcore overclockers doing LN2 and extreme overclocking, yes, that is gonna make a difference. But for 99.9% .9 of consumers out there, whether you be an enthusiast or just your general run of the mill consumer, let the processors do their own thing. They already have precision boost overdrive as well as auto overclocking. So let them do their own thing. And I guess when it comes to choosing a motherboard, you have to think why are you choosing it? So are you going for MSI because you like the brand? you know, you trust the BIOS and you just like what MSI are all about. Or do you go for ASRock because they have this pretty bitchin' clean premium styling to their motherboard uh, with kind of no frills? Or do you go with something like the Gigabyte Aorus 
uh, X570 Aorus Extreme, which literally breaks the mold when it comes to design? Or do you go for something from Zeus with the tough gaming uh, range of motherboards, which kind of gives you lots of connectivity options and lots of other features, but for a very, very, very reasonable price point. Only you can really answer that. So I think it comes down to how much you want to spend, which brand you kind of have an allegiance to and which one you want to go with, what design style you want to go for, and then does it have the features that you need? Yes, we'd all love a godlike coming in at nearly sort of £800 or $800. Same with the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme or Asus's offerings. But do you really need all them features? Only you can answer that. But hopefully this gave you an indication as to, I guess, some of the motherboards that are out there on the market for these new third generation Ryzen processors. Remember there is up to oh, over 150 motherboards for these, uh, including B450, X470 and, X4, and X570. If you don't need PCI Express 4.0, maybe get an X470 or a B450. If you do, then yeah, you have to choose through for one of these. Let me know in the comments section below which board you'd go for. Will it be one of the high end, the mid range, even an ITX motherboard? And which processor would you put with it? 3900X, 3700X, or even one of the other chips that's gonna be coming out at a later date, such as the 3600X, or even that beast 3950X with its stupid amount of cores and threads that's really aimed at the top end workstation kind of thread ripper territory. I'm really eager to know where kind of people's thoughts are on this one. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, you know exactly what to do. And uh, sorry for a bit of a weird one, guys, but it was the only way we could see doing this. But remember, we've got full written reviews down below in the description, and I will have video reviews on all of these boards in the coming weeks. Hopefully you enjoyed it. See you in the next one, guys. Bye-bye. See you later. Power and that more in all in...